to the Positive Future podcast here at Pain Free. And today we have another lovely talk. Uh, it's going to be with Nina, Nina Jukes, and she's going to be talking to us all about feet. She is a holistic podiatrist, and I met her recently up at uh, Barbara O'Neill's amazing event up in Scotland, if you know Barbara O'Neill. And we got chatting, and she said she's a podiatrist. And I was like, wow, look at my feet. <laughs> so, <laughs> At the lunch, wasn't it? <laughs> As you do. <laughs> oh dear. Sounds terrible, but I guess we're all feet focused tonight, so I'm I'm just letting it open there. And um, yeah, I've had terrible trouble for a long time. Uh, well, terrible trouble. I just ignored it as you do. I had an ingrown toenail, toenail, and um, I thought I'd just let it grow out. And but it turns out she says, "Oh, we've got to get you in for an emergency session." So. I don't, I'm not dying. I mean, really? And it turns out she knew exactly, Nina knows, knew exactly uh, what it was not going to grow out. And um, I've been pain free for the first time. I'm doing my yoga. I'm able to uh, sit on my knees now. And I haven't been able to do that for months and months and months. And I went for a run, a run this evening and um, I'm pain free. And it was just, I, I was so delighted she said yes to come on the podcast. And I realized that my big mistake was that I had induced the ingrown toenail. I'd been cutting my nails wrong. So um, she drew that little picture describing how what's, what's going on inside of my nail so I could understand it. And I didn't touch it after that until I saw her for, her, for my uh, treatment. And um, now I know. And what I realized is that we're not taught how to look after our nails properly. Just cut them. And I'd cause damage. And immediately I told my children, don't do this and do do, do that. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Quick. So um, I am delighted she said yes to come on the podcast to educate us and talk about all things feet. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Nina. And thank you so much for coming on to the Positive Future podcast to teach us. Can you tell us all about yourself? How did you get into it all? Right. Um, well, I'm a podiatrist now. I qualified in 1985, so next year it'll be 40 years since I first started doing this. And I guess I got into it just because um, when I was a kid, my dad used to rescue animals <laughs> and I used to rescue frogs and all sorts of creatures and want to help make them better. So I think when I um, was looking at careers, I wanted to do something where I helped to make things better. And as a kid, I really liked the art uh, the arts and the sciences. So it was hard to, I didn't want to just be, do science and I didn't want to just do a pure art degree. Um, and a boy turned up one day in sixth form and said, oh, I've got this. And it was a little prospectus for Chelsea School of Chiropathy in London. And it was a three year course, which led to um, in a, a career where I would be able to diagnose and treat in my own right. And there were loads of NHS jobs at the time because in those days people got free NHS property. And um, and I thought, oh, I could do that. And you know, it just suited my all my skill set because I was I loved working with my hands, liked talking to people. Um, and then there was the science side where you learned medicine and surgery, and um yeah, it was perfect. So I went to college. Natural, natural fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I never once thought that feet were horrible because I never grew up thinking feet were, you know, I thought feet were great. And I used to run around barefoot because I grew up in California for half of my life and um, spent a lot of my time barefoot, never had a problem. Although I did see a podiatrist once as a kid in, in California. And um, that's when I, I learned that you know, these foot doctors, which are actually it's this interchangeable title, chiropathy and podiatry, um, they did other things. They in America, they do a lot of um, surgery and biomechanics, looking at the way people walk and run. So I, I knew there was more to it than just cutting turnouts. So it's actually the science, the, the medicine of foot diseases. So that's what I, and you know, so I qualified in 85. So that was a astropathy, but how did you get to podiatry? Is that in the same? Well, what happened is that the profession actually changed its, um, took on a different title because podiatry um, is an international term and it's got a much wider scope of practice. Whereas, you know, chiropathy was just considered to be skin and nails and um, corns and calluses and verrucas. But podiatry inc includes 
um, nail surgery, um, mechanics and looking at the way people walk and run and um, dermatology and the whole, a, a bigger scope really. Although Chiropoly always di did when I, by the time I qualified, but we changed, the name got changed so that worldwide it would be the same profession. And, mm. uh, so we're now referred to more as podiatrists. So, so podiatry is chiropody, but it's a development on yeah. from chiropody. Yeah, and some some people just do the corns and the callus and the nails, and other people just do the biomechanics and look at the way people walk and run. So, and and some people just do diabetes. It's it's actually quite a massive subject, even though it's just feet. <laughs> Just a bit, a bit like a, a foot doctor. You sort of they just you specialize. You go yeah. down the sort of route that you're. You go down, and and you became a you. You're now a holistic podi podiatrist. So where did that? Well, holistic so, come in? so yeah. So when when I first qualified, I was very sciencey, and I wanted to just I wanted to do foot surgery, and and I was very keen on di di diabetes and wound care. Um, but then a few things happened to my own my own health and I started to realize that there was a lot more to medicine than just drugs and surgery and became very interested in fact it was my personal life I, I was made to become a reflexologist because I was asked <laughs> to work in a clinic in London and in order to work in that clinic which I needed to do to support my family because my marriage had broken up and I, I needed to work to um, pay the nanny and um, I was offered a job where you can come and work in my clinic we'll give you enough to pay the nanny but you've got to <coughs> learn reflexology so I was like oh well why not <laughs> and I did just, learn... just in that just in that clinic they they, yeah. he, they also had a school of reflexology there and he was a friend and and I said okay so I went and did the training while I was oh. working in his clinic one day a week and um at first, I wasn't that respectful of it. I just thought, oh, it's just a kind of foot massage. But then I was absolutely blown away by the power of the treatment and what I discovered about people and, and the reactions to the treatments mm. I gave. Exactly. We have some reflexologists on this call, actually. And, um, yeah, so some people know exactly what you're talking about oh. or anyone who's had a reflexology treatment, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. So I was so amazed and so, so impressed and just thought, oh, there's a lot more. This And then eventually I became a reflexology tutor and taught um, groups of students in London. And, and I taught the anatomy and the physiology side of it, which I always loved, to uh, Birkbeck College in London. Um, uh, there are a few colleges. Anyway, that was all great. And I've continued to uh, although I don't practice as a reflexologist anymore because my daughter is now a reflexologist. She trained right. <laughs> where, I, where I used to train people. And she's also a foot health professional. So she works in my clinic and treats the patients. And I, but I'm still, I still give the odd little um, demo or talk about reflexology and I promote it and I really enjoy it. And so you work for the NHS as a diabetic um, specialist in well, with podiatry. Yeah, and so diabetes has a profound effect on the feet. And unfortunately, when you have very high blood sugar, it actually um, it affects the pH of the blood and it destroys the lining of the blood vessels and it destroys the nerves. And so people end up, after a long time of not having good blood sugars, they end up having... Um, a thing called neuropathy, which is the nerves are damaged and they can either be totally in, a little bit insensitive all the way to no feeling at all, or they can be hypersensitive. It can go the other way. And um, as well as them not having very good circulation and often deformity because the collagen is affected and their feet can get deformed. So it has a terrible effect on the feet and can result if people don't control their blood sugars um, with amputation. And um, I heard about this, job, yes. Yeah, so my job was to stop people having amputations. And I was, I used to get to see all the worst feet in Suffolk. Because they, <laughs> <laughs> they referred to me after the nurse and the doctor and the chiropodist had all given up. And then we, we had a team of people at the West Suffolk and we would do our best to remove the dead skin and edge, try to get them to um if they had ulcerations to pad them up and 
put them in shoes which took the pressure off and um, educate them that actually they need to, you know, it is serious. The thing with diabetes is that people, when they newly diagnosed, they don't realize that the damage, they can't feel it being done. So it can be years and it's too late by the time they finally thought, ah, actually, I've got neuropathy, I've got no circulation and it's um, a bit late in the day. But if we can do preventative medicine and teach people, and that's where Barbara O'Neill was great because she was talking about pH and diet. And... Exactly, you know, education, isn't it? If you don't know, you don't know. And a lot of us, I think, just sort of uh, muddle on through or get on with things and just try to live life and have this problem that problem and uh like I was I just thought that nail was just gonna grow out and um I had no idea that it was never gonna grow out and it was actually getting worse and worse and I, I didn't know that so education is so important definitely so yeah. then you so off you left the NHS did you and then you started well, I, I actually I continued to work for the NHS until 2012 so I worked for the NHS all the way through um but I just reduced my hours so I eventually did 50-50 and um, I set up my own clinic in Suffolk, um, along with, it was the Complementary Medicine Centre in I, where, um, in Suffolk, where we are. And I worked with other great team of people. Um, Tell me about that team, because they influenced uh, you, wasn't they? they you took were, on yeah, but they did. Um, there was Sue Saunders and Lindsay Hickey were two amazing homeopaths who um, are sort of semi-retired at the moment, well, Sue's still working. But I learned so much from them and homeopathy became another thing in my tool bag, if you like. Um, I did some small training courses and learned about first aid homeopathy, but I also knew who to refer to the homeopath. So for amazing things like sports injuries, Arnica, Rust Tox and Ruta, remedies that um, are well known to help those kind of injuries. And also Arnica for bruising and shock. Um, and anyway, so so I, although I don't um, prescribe because as a podiatrist, that's out of my remit, I can say, go and see the homeopath for this because she'll have something for you, particularly things like verrucas for children. So I haven't treated children for verrucas for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. When I was in the NHS, we, were, we um, treated kids with acids and um, freezing and burning and horrible conditions, horrible treatments, which were really painful. And um, yeah. verrucas are actually caused by a little virus that gets our, our um, gets into our cells, the outer layer of our skin cell, and it uses our DNA to make it in our own skin. So our body can't recognize verrucas very easily. And um, the yeah. conventional treatment is that you, um, cut them out, burn them out, or freeze them out. But that really hurts, and your body doesn't necessarily um, respond in the correct way, and the verruca can just continue or spread. So these acids that you can get over the counter are quite risky, because usually kids, when mums put them on their children, they do it in good faith that they're going to do some good. And what actually happens is that the acid can spread the, the verruca. So if I have a child with a verruca, I... I nearly always refer them to a homeopath or say leave it alone and cover it with tape and it will go away so it's God. i had um, a client the other day she had a horrendous horrendous story about she was um, at the time when you'd leave your children to be um, treated by the nurse or doctor away from the parents they were cut they were shut out mm -hmm. and she had an unbelievably awful experience so it's really wonderful that there's another way yeah, <laughs> And I, with adults, I use a laser. I've got a class 3B laser, which might you might be able to see. Him. I know you've got an extraordinary contraption over there, isn't it? That is uh, very, very specialist um, equipment to treat yes. funguses and verrucas and... And wounds. It, um, wounds. Yeah, the, the light helps wounds heal. So years ago when I was doing diabetic foot medicine, we would use these um, laser treatments to um, help with pain and, and to try and improve the circulation so we could get wounds to heal. But um, now I use mine on adults with fungal, fungal infections or verrucas, um, again, to try and stimulate an immune response in the body rather than just yeah. cutting it out and bashing it, you know, to get the body to heal naturally. And um, the body heals from within, doesn't it? We have to 
provide the right circumstances and the right mental state or emotional state or whatever it is and the body will heal and um, can you tell me a bit more about um we talked about the holistic angle of of your work and your your ability and you were telling me the other day about that lady who was absolutely petrified as i was a bit scared going oh, into your clinic yeah. as well yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, that, that was using EFT, emotional freedom technique. But um, before I finish, about um, one more thing about Veruca's is I always get people to get their vitamin D levels checked because quite often they're actually their their D levels are very low and they haven't got enough white blood cells to fight. They've got low immunity, so you know we look at that side of it as well. But yeah, no emotional freedom technique, fabulous. I learned that in, um, what year? I've got a certificate up here. I'm just trying to remember. Show me a certificate. <laughs> 2004. 2004, I did this this bioenergetic health training. For, it was a year-long course, weekends. And um, so I learned emotional freedom technique. I'm sure most people on the call probably have heard of it. But if you haven't, um, <clears throat> it was it was discovered as a technique um, around the time of the Vietnam War. And um, it was a guy called Gary Craig was taught how to do it. And he was a lay preacher. And he um, he decided he went on the course and spent a lot of money, but then he didn't, he thought that this was too good to keep from the world. So he decided to reproduce the course and give it to the world for free. And that was in the days when you had cassette tapes. <laughs> and um, so Gary Craig went everywhere and he was going around and he was, there were some films where he was teaching people how to do it and you tap different parts of your body. Um, there are quite a lot of parts of, around the face and the hands. And whilst tapping, you um, say something to yourself pertaining to the condition. Um, so I, ha I had a, and I don't practice, I use these techniques in my practice, but I don't say, oh, I'm an EFT practitioner but I obviously I've trained. And so this old lady comes in and she's um, very frightened. She's got lots of nails that are growing in and some of her toes are sort of blue purple color, <laughs> very cold feet and she didn't look in the best of health. So I was a little bit worried about even touching her because obvious signs of bad circulation. Anyway, so she's, I go to actually examine her and the first thing she does is pull her feet away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is, um, you know, I basically you don't have that long to, so um, I said, okay, why, what's, you know, why, why are you so frightened? And she, she then it went on to explain that she'd seen somebody in the past and they'd really hurt her. So although she wanted me to fix her, she didn't really want me to touch her. So I just thought, oh, I'll try this EFT. And I, I said, right, well, I've got an idea. Why don't you tell me why you're scared and tell me the story of what happened? And I'll just take, if you don't mind taking off your glasses, and I'll just um, tap your face. So she sat in the chair and, well, she, she tells me that what happened. And I'm just tapping her points. And then we do her fingernail, you know, her little fingers and her karate chop point and after about three rounds she says oh okay I'm ready now and I was able to do a treatment and remove the painful areas and and a few weeks later she came back about six weeks later for a review and the first thing she said is will you do that tapping thing dear because <laughs> it obviously made her feel so relaxed and and it was just great so it's it's wonderful to have these little tools in your yeah. tools to hear to use as part of the practice fantastic and um you, you, you're going to mention somebody that uh, came into your clinic recently <clears throat> which said you you jotted down somebody you wanted to talk about someone recent or something oh well this yeah there's gosh there's lots lots and lots um what that did you say was, like yeah was that, that was different uh, yeah but <laughs> um <laughs> Yes, there's a few different case studies. Um, and we, let's see how much time have we got. <laughs> Just looking at yeah, the clock. We're, yeah, we're good. We're good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, the one that came in recently, it's not so much what I did, but what I just, it's the clinical picture. So this old lady, she comes in, she's 80 now. And I, the first time I saw her was last week. And I said, well, why are you here? Because when they, you know, I like to 
ask all the questions. We do a full a medical history um, a and the consultation form is, you know, I try to produce a diagnosis based on their medical history and what I can see. And from the minute somebody walks into the clinic, I'm, you know, I'm listening to them, I'm looking at them, you touch them. It's a, it's a proper time spent examining somebody. And so you know, I'm looking at all that's going on. And the first thing she says to me is that the reason she's coming to see me is because her other corporatus was um, not confident enough to treat her because she's got no immune system. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. Why haven't you got any immune system? She says, well, I've got this thing called neutropenia. I'm like, okay. Um, and she said, so I'm really scared I'm going to get an infect. I've got an infection or I've got something. Anyway, all she had, bless her, was a little corn on one toe and a thick nail. So I said, well, you know, sit back, we'll sort you out. And as I'm treating her, I'm thinking, you know, her medical history said um, she had she had been taking a omeprazole. And she was also, she had osteoporosis. And she'd also been on a drug which is called alandroic acid, which helps to Heart is given for osteoporosis. And then she got a fractured spine. And then she's now been put on these drugs. Oh, sorry, that's one of my children ringing me. <laughs> Doesn't obviously know I'm on a call. <laughs> that's the joys of life. Oh, life. My, it's my watch. <laughs> sorry, everybody. <laughs> my watch that did that. I was thinking the phone's turned off. Okay. So anyway, the story with this lady is that I looked at her medical history and I thought, and I said to her, how long have you been on the omeprazole? And she said, oh, about 30 years. So wow. for anybody who doesn't know, omeprazole is the most widely prescribed drug worldwide. And it's prescribed for acid reflux, often for people with hiatus hernia. Well, acid reflux is really, really provoked by stress because our vagus nerve is intimately involved in, sorry, I, I, I don't know how to turn my phone off to make it stop looking. Hold on, I'll, hopefully he'll just get it, but he's, I'm going to, I might have to put it in the other room. Um, our vagus nerve links our mind and our gut. And so if you're worried about things, you'll get churned up and you can quite easily have acid reflux. Well, if you take a omeprazole, it dampens down the acid in your stomach, but you need that acid when you digest protein. And it, another consequence of omeprazole is it actually blocks calcium metabolism in your body. And so after years of taking omeprazole, you can get osteoporosis. So, this lady was still on the omeprazole, even though they've been giving her drugs for osteoporosis. And the allandroic acid that they give you, or give people, um, actually, you have to have the tablet standing up, because otherwise, if you sit down and you're not moving, they'd like turn to like cement in your guts. So that's really nasty. So if they can't take it orally, they'll then take it um, by an infusion. And what it does is it does make harder bone, but the bone becomes brittle. So her treatment, her drugs that she had taken um, were to do with that. Now, a good, there are other ways to treat osteoporosis and there are other ways to treat acid reflux. But we'll just carry on with this lady's story. So she'd had these two drugs and then one day she bends her down to do something and she gets searing pain in her spine and her spine has got a thing called a pathological fracture and that's when your bones just break just like that you don't even have to do much they just break it's all crumbly so her spine has started to crumble and so she goes to the doctor and they eventually diagnose it and um they give her an infusion of another drug and so she's having these infusions, and that, which is for osteoporosis. And I said, um, so, and she said, yes, and I was just about to have my next infusion and they did a blood test and they said, I have neutropenia. And I'm like, oh, okay. So neutropenia is not enough white blood cells. And I said, that's interesting that they did the blood test just before they were gonna give you that drug. Do you think they were checking maybe a side effect of the drug? And she said, oh, I don't know, dear, but they said there was nothing to do with, nothing to do with the 
the drug they're giving me. And I thought, hmm. So I quickly, while she sat there, I just quickly wrote in neutropenia and this drug, demoxamab, something like that. Can't remember the exact spelling, um, but it's a new biological type drug. And there it is, 124 people out of every thousand get neutropenia. That's wow. more than 10%. That, and it's just shocking. So this poor lady has now got no white blood cells. She's got a broken back and she can't reach her feet. She's terrified she's going to die of an infection. And this is all because her original gastric reflux was treated with the way it was treated. Okay, there might have been other factors. She probably doesn't need vitamin D and, you know, and she weight bearing exercise also helps. But there are other ways to treat osteoporosis. <laughs> so then there are other ways to not get it. So, and, you know, as, with, as, as in a holistic, holistic uh, uh, point of view, you know, you're looking at the whole person, the whole picture. Yeah. Maybe it's just stress. That was I it. Know, I know. And so, you know, mm -hmm. I get I get re acid reflux occasionally because I have a really stressful life. I'm always on the go. Haven't oh. been yet today. And um, and if I do, I know I'm doing too much. I've got to just do some more meditation, maybe not to keep so much body. coffee. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Listen to your body. Be a detective for yourself. Yeah. What does your what's your body telling you? What do you need? What don't you need? exactly well, it, it might be emotional it always tells you and and um particularly things like um your vagus your vagus nerve is amazing and fascinating but it, you can actually calm it down by tapping just there as well and so simple so many things we can do and you know aromatherapy you know relaxation techniques mindfulness yeah. and so so with uh, the foot focus of things um, it might be just that the medication is not suiting you or it's 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 creating foot yeah. problems. Well, that's another one. That's yeah. another one. Another interesting story. A man came to me and he, bless him, he was an amazing man, really intelligent. He came and he was a bag of nerves and he was really scared because his feet were blue and he was in a lot of pain. And he sat down and he said, um, you know, I've got this problem. And he, his feet looked like he was covered in chill blains. And when I went through his drugs, he was taking a drug which was a beta blocker. Now beta blockers stop the circ they reduce the circulation to your feet. And he was also on quite a lot of drugs for his mental health, but it was so toxic. He wasn't able to walk, go for a walk because his feet hurt. And so I said, well, did you realize that your circulation is being affected by those drugs? Could you go back to the doctor and ask if the doctor can give you something else? Because actually he didn't need beta blockers for his heart. They were giving him beta blockers because his heart was beating fast because he was stressed. But that was an emotional thing. And um, once we got him off the beta blockers, got him into some comfortable shoes, because shoes are a major, major thing. And um, he came back the other day, it was uh, um, last week, and he sat down, he looked like a different man. He was a different colour. He was wearing different colour clothes. His hair was all cut. And he said, you know, thank you, you've saved my life. You know, I, he wasn't going yeah. out. And it's so it's such a rewarding job to be able to help somebody move forward in life and walk yeah. and you know it's but it is it's the the key is to um look at the whole picture and put all the little bits together and then see what how we can help and which direction what's the cause why exactly it's not just the presenting condition it's just the tip of the iceberg it's a i like to call it, it's a message it's a message it wants to be heard it's telling you something about yourself um now gail's talking asking about bunions we haven't talked about our bunions yet and she's looking at having an operation she's been um... oh okay gail i can't see you because my computer's doing all this it's like an, i don't even know where the screen but i'll just say hi uh, I'll read it off then. She says, um, uh, what are your thoughts on bunion issues? I may be having an operation to help mine on one foot. The other foot is not so bad. She had an x-ray and the surgeon says she's eligible for the operation. She's still thinking about it. What okay. do you think? Well, I think, think very carefully. Some bunion operations are good. If Does your big toe still move? Or is it completely fixed? Does your foot move? Um, I can't see. Um, if, you want Gail... sort of nod, if you want, girl, if you want to nod or put some more. Um, I can't uh, actually see. Chat. Just... Where's Gail gone? Has she switched herself off? Oh, I think she left us. Hang on. <laughs> I think she pressed the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
no, I think I've pressed the wrong button now. Oh, she's back, she's back. She well, says, I... thumbs up, she says. I can't see anybody now because I've pressed the wrong button. <laughs> It's a story of life, and uh, people at Pain Free know all about the technical issues, don't we? <laughs> uh, yeah. Gail, so um, um, what was the answer? Do you want to listen? Why, why don't we? Un, uh, it's um, yeah. So uh, we can bring in conversation of chat now if you want to, and I'd, it'd be great to go and talk about um, different kinds of foot problems. But we can bring on a uh, gal now. Is that okay, Nina? It's okay, but I've just I'm now looking at a blank screen, so I can't see anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I so, in some ways this might be better because i might be um can you up. hear can you hear uh, me now i can hear you gail but i can't yeah. see you that's okay. oh that's okay so tell me about your feet yes yeah, so my toe does my big toe does move yes um and the i went to the hospital yesterday actually for the x-ray on a sunday which is unusual and he said it's actually hereditary and there was a name for it. He said, no matter what you would have done with your feet, if you'd worn no shoes ever, um, they would have turned in like this. Because um, yeah. my cousins all have it uh, right. as well. Yeah. Um, oh, they want to see you again. So I'm, I, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm not sure about going ahead with the operation or not because of the recovery time, because I'm actually a guest house owner. Right. So um, to try and time it for the winter, for recovery yeah. time. So do you want the operation because it's awkward to fit shoes or do you want the operation because your foot hurts? Both. Okay. Awkward. I, I'm very limited with my shoes and it hurts uh, a lot, mainly in the winter when I've got enclosed shoes. Because yeah. all summer I wear a particular sandal that doesn't bother me at all. So, so the thing is, your feet are probably functioning okay. Yeah. Um, um, but the problem is accommodating that big, that big lump, you know, that yeah. big shape. So I'll show you something. I've got skeleton here. So I don't know if you can see me, but I've got my skeleton. I, I can see you. <laughs> so, so um, with the, if nobody, um, anybody who doesn't know about what a bunion is, it's called Helix valgus. That's the Latin name he would have used. And um, what this bone moves out, so it makes that very wide, and that bone goes that way. Yeah, and all the other toes are doing the same. All the other yeah. toes are. So they all have to get out of the way as well because that's pushing yeah. out. Usually, this one hammers. Um, it is a problem, but people that have the operation ask the surgeon how many people get pain afterwards because at the moment you haven't got any pain. It's just a nuisance with the shoes. Yeah. Yeah, it, have, I get pain if I wear the wrong, if I wear too much of an enclosed shoe for any length yeah. of time. But what's the real, re the reason why it's hereditary is because the problem is here, this joint, this bone here is the talus and it sits on top of the 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 heel bone. And when you walk, you're, you're, you've probably got quite supple joints. Do your feet flop? Yeah, yeah, I do. Are you always quite supple? Yeah, and still am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So people that are very mobile, what happens is that when your your foot, when when it walks, it, you should. If you can see my chair, you probably can. Yeah. Can. So, so you should. So you should be able to. You strike with your heel, and then the foot goes over like that, and shock absorbs, and then as you go forward, the foot's supposed to straighten up and push off. Your kind of foot goes over, but instead of straightening it up properly, it doesn't straighten enough. So as you push forward, you've got a loose bag of bones, which has made that one go over and that one go that way. Now, right. if you correct, if we support that part of your foot when you're walking, this stays in alignment more, which is better for your knees, because when you do that, your knees also get grindy on the inside. Um, if we support your foot, you can help a lot with the foot pain, but it's still you've still got that really wide, wide forefoot. So if you can find shoes, that's great. The only trouble if you have the operation, you'll have a more narrow foot because they'll they'll cut this bit off and they'll pull it in and screw, screw it together, and they'll probably straighten the second toe for you. I just just pick up the um pick up the thing in into yeah. the camera so get your set. So so they'll they'll. They'll sort that out. They'll take this bone. They'll cut across there. Yeah, they said they were going to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and then they'll straighten it. 
and they'll straighten this one so it'll look better in your footwear but unfortunately what happens is that underneath there's a little there's a little uh, strap that goes across there and and that mm -hmm. often fails and then one of these will can fall down so a lot of people who have the bunion operation they, they often get pain after surgery that doesn't go away because they're wow. full. so it's something to consider your foot might look better it'll be easier to fit the shoes but you might end up with foot pain or a new a corn that you never had before underneath and in your opinion do you think bunions stay do they get worse and worse and worse as you get older or <sighs> But I usually, I do a thing called foot mobilization and I give my patients um, exercises to strengthen yeah. their, their little I've muscles. I've got books on it all. I've got books about all the different exercises. Yeah. So which ones do you do? Pulling the, pulling the, sitting, pulling the toe away and also stretching my toes out. Yeah. Stretching, you know, for five minutes now and again, just stretching them apart. Yeah. There's um, a good exercise called scrunch where you stand and you pull your toes up and raise your arches. You yeah, and that. trying to walk on the outside more, be more aware of the way I walk. Yeah. The outside hard, of the foot. It's hard to do when you're very mo very your mo because your yeah. muscles have to work twice as hard to keep your bones in line, which is why yeah. you've got this. So I would wear a supportive shoe that's with an orthotic to help support your feet. But right. that means a lace-up shoe, and, and slip-on shoes are just not for, good for people with bunions. No. I tend to mainly wear trainers. Yeah. That's good. You know. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Okay, thank you. I mean, it's up to you, and, I and you know, nobody's going to blame you if you have the surgery, but it, there is that risk of having more pain after. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> well, okay, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Gail. And uh, Rona says that in Chinese medicine, it's connected to the spleen, weakness which affects the muscles. Yeah. So that, that might be another avenue, Gail, to have a look down, look at uh, Chinese medicine, meridians, go and see uh, acupuncture. Um, acupuncture, acupressure, shiatsu, uh, even reflexology. We do uh, reflex points, uh, as you know, uh, Nina, about uh, on, on with reflexology. So look, look, look at perhaps a, another avenue to look look down spleen yeah um yeah so um uh questions thick and fast now <laughs> um pete's had a uh, two reoccurring issues nail fungus in both big toes and i think these things we're talking about um ingrown toenail nails and fungus and bunions they're, they're such common problems yeah. people have yeah, yeah. Uh, and um and as you mentioned uh, for many years um cracked heels which always seem worse yeah um when he's back in greece uh, where he lives uh swimming daily wearing sandals i've tried all sorts of oils creams nothing seems to make a difference right um so fungal right. infections are really hard to get rid of because um for a start fungus eats the protein in our skin and our nails and our hair it loves it there's a type of um, fungus called trichophytum rubrum which is um it's really endemic in the population and most people have some spores on them but whether they actually take hold and show as um you know d doing well and happy um depends a little bit on your own biology and your own immune system so they particularly like people that are sugary or people that have high acid and you know an acid balance that's you know um eating lots of sweets drinking alcohol maybe not drinking enough water um, just having an imbalance in the microbiome as well so what's going on in the gut that's kind of the inside and the skin's the outside so when i treat when i have somebody with a fungal infection i'll say first of all start start off with drinking eight glasses of water a day it's pretty much anybody who knows barbara o'neill it's all her principles so you know drinking the water um, looking at your diet if as far as skin goes um, fungus hates the light it hates sunshine. So it's, think of a mushroom. They like dark, moist, warm. So that's exactly what's in a shoe. So, you know, people don't often have fungus on their hands, but they've got it on their feet because the environment suits the fungus. So you change the environment. So if you've got um, wet, soggy feet, then you use witch hazel or surgical spirit or um, something that dries them. This is often builders and people who wear big 
thick boots all day. But if you've got a very dry, flaky skin, which sounds like your cause, um, then you want to use a, a really good emollient to keep the skin hydrated and, and moistened. Um, and I've just made one out of marigold, um, using marigolds. So making a, an infusion of marigolds in oil and um, then adding some really nice aromatherapy oils such as um, frankincense or tea tree or um, even lavender. They're, they're gentle things you can use often. But uh, the other thing I was gonna say is that 10% in America, a big research study was done into fungus, fungal nails, and of 10% of, of the samples had resistant fungus, so resistant to all known drugs. And the, the one we use the most is called tabinafin, or also known as Lamisil, which you can buy over the counter. But more and more people are getting resistance to that. So that's why I've started going back to the old things and going, well, you know, marigold is amazing. You know, calendula, you just can get some flowers, put them in hot water, soak your feet in that, or get marigold oil or calendula ointment. That's very highly antifungal and immune boosting. And what was um, the name of the laser? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. There's and also the and the laser, and um, so you're 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 putting high density light on it. it. Doesn't like light. And what what did you decide to call your cream? Because we I was asking you, and you said you haven't got a name for it. <laughs> I don't know yet. I don't know yet. But it's um fab, fab feet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I I just think it's a really lovely combination of um gold frankincense and myrrh, but it's marigold frankincense and myrrh. So it was going to be like a Christmas. Um, a Christmas oil that I produce for my patients. I mean, most I don't sell any of my oils and potions I make because I'm not a medical herbalist, but I've studied herbal medicine and done an introductory course. So I use things on myself and um, in my clinic because I know that they're all organic and safe. But, um, you know, I'm too busy to make them. <laughs> I, I refer people to that lovely herbalist you had on the other day um, to buy products from because, you know, yes. But there are so many things, you know, we're surrounded in nature by amazing plants that are there to heal us and help us, and most of them are very safe. But again, Absolutely. back to the guy with the fungal infection, I say it's a multi pronged approach. You need to look at the skin and the environment you're in, it's number one. Number two, um, look at your diet, and um, then look at what you can put on to soothe that. Because um, it's very uncomfortable having very dry, flaky skin with cracks. So, you know, see a good podiatrist locally and get them to remove any real thick skin. And then um, you can apply an, an emollient. There's also a good one. There are quite a few good, good products on the market. Or you can go for the, you know, the strong drug called tabinafine and use that as a cream. So, you know, I have, I, I have conventional treatments as well as, you know, yeah, I think that's the best way. We need a bit of all wells, I think. And um, so, uh, Pete, does that answer your question? You've got the recording to listen back to, to listen to all the different things that Nina was saying, and every, for everybody, of course. Um, ask another question if you need to ask ask another question, <laughs> Pete. Um, Mariana, could uh, Nina show what the scratch exercise are, please? Ah, oh, scratch. Do you want me to demonstrate? <laughs> um, yeah. I've got, a, I've got a hand out here. I wonder if we can. Pete says thanks. So hopefully oh, that's uh, the answer. Well, like, shall I do a deck? I could maybe you could see my feet and I can do the. I don't know. Do the demo. Stand, <laughs> stand. Probably can't actually. But this is this. Can you see? Can you do, they probably can you see that picture or is it too dark? So you got. Uh, Back of two heels. So it's two, that's two two feet where they're they're clenching the, the toes. toes. Can you see toes. The toes clenched, and you lift the, you raise the arch, and you slightly turn on the side. So like picking up picking up yeah. a pencil with your toes. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's so you hold. So basically, what I do is that the exercise to strengthen ankles. It involves morning and night when you're brushing your teeth. First of all, it's the, the first exercise is a heel raise. So you, you raise your, your heels off the ground and you hold them, go all the way up to the top so that your heels are, your 
right on to the nose. <laughs> Let me see if I can stand. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna try and do some acrobatics now with my bare feet. Um, and then yeah. <laughs> we see we want you in one piece, podiatrist. <laughs> right, can you see? Sure. Can you see me? Is it stable? Yeah. We can see you. All right. So can you see my feet? This is a full demonstration tonight. <laughs> can you see my feet? Yes. Well, I, I can't see what I'm doing. I'm just right. Okay, so so scrunch is you pull your toes out and move and move your ankles sideways. Can you see that? Yeah. And you hold that for 20 seconds while you're brushing your teeth every morning and every night. And then you do the heel raise. So you raise up, up, up all the way onto the all the way, and then you go down to three quarters and you hold your heels off the ground for the count of 20. And you see that my ankle joint is now stable, it's in the middle. And after 20 seconds, you go down again. And then you do the scratch again, and then you do the heel rise again. And you do that both exercises twice, in the morning, twice at night. And that is called isometric exercising. And it strengthens your um, little muscles of the feet and of the legs without really exhausting you. And because you do it every time you brush your teeth, it becomes part of your your routine. And it's not... So, so, so it's scrunching up and then, did you say you tip your ankles? Yeah, you sort of tip, pull your toes in and then tip your ankles slightly sideways so that you're a little bit on the edge of the outside of your feet. And just hold that position because you're holding your muscles into a position where they're pulling your foot over and stopping it collapsing. Because the worst thing is that feet roll in too much. It can then... Um, really grinds on the, the knee and the hip joint. So we haven't even started talking about the biomechanics. Of, mm. <laughs> you know, if, you're, if your hip collapses or you've had a hip operation, how that affects your feet. It's, it's, a, whole level, it's a whole other level, isn't it? And as you're saying, it's, it's, the, it's the holistic approach to look at the whole story, the diet, the, the, the environment, the stress, the, the whole body. Your body doesn't do anything on its own as an individual piece it's a it's a whole story to look at the whole picture isn't it yeah. so um and then you know nhs comes along and throws drugs at you that ca can cause all sorts of problems and then you're offered operations and that's pretty much all you're offered isn't it apart from a few specialists yeah it's sort the of problem is that they, they look at all the parts of the body in isolation so somebody does the eyes and somebody does somebody <laughs> does the jaw and somebody does the hip you know and, and somebody you know does the bow and actually you need one person who hope, would have in the past maybe been the GP the general practitioner would have hopefully sort of brought it all together but now the poor GPs are so busy they they're only allowed 10 minutes and how can you diagnose a person in 10 minutes you know you, you need to you know if somebody came to, to a GP and they had they had heel pain and they had conjunctivitis and they had um, venereal problem so they had a bit of an itchy drip <laughs> so it's a man right so um you've got these three things and you're only allowed to go to the doctor and mention one thing now so he mentioned no. heel pain and the doctor will say oh you've got plantar fasciitis because they call all heel pain plantar fasciitis because that's what they know but actually if you've got heel pain and conjunctivitis and some um rather nasty um drip <laughs> from your penis it's a condition called writer's disease and it's actually a syndrome and how would you know that unless you the person was allowed to tell you all the other symptoms they've got you know it, it's it's just yeah. crazy the way medicine's done now it needs to be done as a as a looking at people holistically and it's it's like the hip surgeon he, you know you can have a new hip put in and your your hip pain will disappear but my, a huge percentage of people that have hip operations have um, a difference in leg length afterwards. So if you've got one leg longer than the other, that's going to affect your spine, your knee, your hip on the other side. And people come to me with foot pain as a result of having a hip done. So it's it's all connected. Hip bones connected to the knee bone, connected <laughs> to the foot bone. It's all connected, and not only physically all the way up. It's all compensates, but it's your emotions, your life situation yeah. past traumas and 
mental states. It's a whole package of you, isn't it? So I think holistic is the way to go. And Mariana says, um, do, do the exercises work with the flexible joints as you're talking to Gail? Yeah, with Gail? yeah, yeah. So if you've got very flexible joints, it, it's great to um, exercise them and, and do this quite gentle isotonic exercises. But um, a lot of people with um, hypermobility, you know, it's it's a it's a scale, it's a spectrum. So some people are just a little bit too mobile, and other people are really too mobile. Um, but a lot of common um, denominator is pain, and they often have leg pain because their muscles are working so hard to keep their bones in the right place that they end up with very very um, solid muscles. And the best thing for that is because um, they often get foot pain as a result is using um, a little massage gun to massage the leg muscles but um, we do it in a to jostle the muscles for about three minutes morning and night so you're not you're not digging it in but you're just wobbling <laughs> so you can get a um, you can get a little massage gun and go up and down the leg and that really helps with leg and foot pain with hypermobile people sometimes just the simple things like vibration isn't it a vibration machine or i, I was at some an exhibition recently with uh Cl did, you, did you see clive de carl's um special chairs magic chairs he calls oh, yeah, them. yeah yeah People who saw it. Magic, chairs. magic chairs and i think sometimes you know the the mechanics that we can use are simple things just like heat or vibration or you know warm water or hot water bottle or a heated blanket or something or vibration things like uh, Clive de Carl's magic chairs or uh, tens machines or this this uh, wobbling um, well you didn't say what what was the word you said to jostling jostling, <laughs> jostling action yeah jostling action so you're, you're just encouraging the body to unbuckle to relax yeah. to unwind yeah. unwind isn't it you know and 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 regular uh, focusing on relaxing the body on your on yourself in some way on a regular basis can help well help wonders isn't it just relaxes the muscles or stress levels and um simple sort of um jostling yes yeah <laughs> on some yeah. level fantastic and um so um what, what so what are the sort of um things that people come to you for for all of these things is there anything we haven't mentioned any kind of conditions that are um, regular oh. that you see well, besides, you know, ingrown toenails, are, we talked about that. Do you want me to show you the little picture of the nail, how to cut a nail properly? Show us a little picture, because this is something, <laughs> an everyday thing. I'm, I've been cutting my nails wrong for years, and I had no idea I'd caused the ingrown toenail. I thought it was just, I thought, what's wrong with my toes? It's my toes. What's the matter with them? Why can't they grow straight? <laughs> well, so, so, well, I've got somewhere I've got a little picture. Oh, yeah, so basically, there's a... A little picture. That's so that's how a toenail yeah. should be, and you just cut it straight across, and you you let the nail these little these little bits here, the corners of the nail should grow out of the groove, and you should allow a little bit past that groove that you know that the nail grows in, and then the shoe should be big enough so that it you do, the nail if it does grow a bit longer doesn't touch the shoe, but if you get if it starts to bother you, and then you grow you cut cut down the side, or oh, that one I think, then it's easy to cut the side, but to miss the last little bit breaks. And then when that last little pointy bit starts to grow forward, that's the bit that grows into the skin. And- um, Just look at the picture a little bit, a little bit high, that's it. Yeah. So so that's exactly what I did. I, I cut it across and obviously I didn't know how a nail grows. And I'd, I'd obviously somehow missed that little corner yeah. and that was growing into my flesh for months and months and months. So we managed to get that out, but we, but because I had to cut it back further, I, I need to see you again and then we'll pack it with foam. Uh -huh. So anybody that's got a nail that thinks that it, it's growing in, rather than cutting the corner out, try and put a little bit of foam or cotton wool under the, under the nail edge and that will try and lift it out so it can grow past the groove. Because um, you see sure. now you, you you drew that little picture when we when we met, and I thought, oh, now I understand. I I didn't maybe maybe I, I'm ignorant, and other people know. I don't know, but um, I'd missed something so um comprehensive that I should, that we're not taught typically how to cut our own nails properly. Most most and people I, cut them too short. 
Most people mm. cut them much too short. And well, I've been having words with my children. Don't do this. <laughs> don't do that. And and you also said um, the gap between the end of your toe and the end and inside your shoe should be uh, your thumb, your own thumb. Yeah. Width, yeah. Which is about between five and ten mil. So the shoe should end. Uh, you should have a, a an area where there's no no sh no toe no foot which is an empty space <laughs> so the foot can expand because the foot when we walk it does that it it moves so if the shoe if the shoe is fitting you know like like that as it as it as it expands it, the foot presses against the material and the material presses back and that's one of the main causes of very curved nails because the years of the the material pushing onto the nail so yeah, and um and then uh, you said uh, slip-on shoes are dreadful yeah <laughs> slip-on shoes are they're okay from the car to the bar and to just you know <laughs> look pretty and hang out in them but don't walk anywhere in them because if they're slip-on in order to fit correctly um well in order to keep a slip-on shoe on it has to be tight because it holds on to you so the only way that a slip-on shoe um will stay on your foot as if it's in effect too too small and your foot won't be able to move into an empty space. It will be butting against the material. So, so lace up, have... nice good lace up shoe. It's deep enough and wide enough and and uh, long sound enough. Like my head, sound like my headmistress. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but you can't get good looking shoes. And, and most people who wear trainers, you know, they're more comfy. They are, isn't it? So trainers all around everybody and, and make sure the shoe is holding onto your foot properly. Yeah, and, and you've um, got a gap. And, and you've got a gap. And um, so um, Mariana was saying uh, GPs are not general practitioners anymore. I agree, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. So Rosemary is saying, um, my advice to is to uh, do not take drugs. Don't take drugs. <clears throat> um, it only puts money in their bank. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, they're chemicals and the body does not recognise them. Stay away from doctors and hospitals, <laughs> whenever possible. Um, yeah, it seems to be the way that it is these days, isn't it? And uh, there are so many healers in nature. Uh, she has all the answers. Absolutely, Rosemary. And, um, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. We, 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 it's about um, investigating ourselves. What do we need? Look at our problems and think, well, what's that telling us? What's mm -hmm. What's that problem? You know, yeah. be an investigator. Uh, and, and, Mary, they, you know, and cholesterol isn't the evil thing that we they all they're trying to push, you know, they're trying to push the statin drugs on all these old people. And people are coming to me with terrible leg pains and weakness, and it's only since they've had the statins. And if statins physically just damage muscle, muscles are damaged by statin use. And um anyway, and the heart is a muscle, so you know, there you go. <laughs> Mm. And uh, Dr. Re Rima Labo of um, Natural Natural Solution uh, Natural F uh, Solutions Foundation, she said that um, iotrogenic drugs can't say that <laughs> doctors' drugs uh, yeah. are the are the third biggest killer in the world, yeah. and also they uh, Dr. Rima says that uh, they cause acidity in the body. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. So we're, we're learning, isn't it? And Mariana says that she wears woolen socks and her foot slips. When I wear my foot, hmm. Hmm. What slips inside the sock? Hmm. I don't that? know. I would, it, it, sometimes it depends on what you're wearing it with. Woolen socks are great, but they might be a bit, they might be a bit baggy because they, they're often not very elastic-y. Um, I, I really like, I like bamboo and cotton and wool, but maybe you need to wear two pairs of socks and have, you know, I, I think, I know what you mean about the wool slipping, but maybe that should be an outer sock, but you have an inner sock if you're going on a walk and want a, a lot of warmth. Could it be? Could it be the holding of the shoe on your foot, Mariana? I, I know when I went to I, when I I bought some walking shoes and they just they they felt my foot was like snug in the shoe because it was a proper sort of could it could it be that? Do you think, Nina? 
yeah. could it be the I mean, you need the foot to not move in the shoe the foot has to be held snugly around the heel laced up right you know high up um so the lace has to come so i show <laughs> i'll show you the perfect shoe <laughs> This is a really good shoe. So it's got a lace that goes up high. Can you see that? Yes. So the lace. Yeah. And Marianne says yes. It's when, it's when she goes for a hike. Yeah. They um. You if the foot is moving in the shoe, then try to do the laces up in a different way, or um, yeah, shoes or maybe an insole. I see somebody sorry, said. I, sorry. I I interrupted you showing about the shoes. Sorry. I should have I should have waited to can you just show us the shoe again just explain oh. what, what's the good bits about the shoe oh no it's just that the good bit is that it's well it's it's foot shaped so it's you know roundish toe it's not pointy it's it should be this is depth is important so you should always look at that if you especially if you've got bent toes because sometimes the toe sticks up more than the depth so you have to get a nice deep shoe and it should lace up high because shoes that only lace up to about there, they're not really laces, they're decoration. <laughs> they have to lace up high to hold the foot, to hold the foot properly. Right, that's great, Nina. Thank you so much. You're educating us left, right and centre. <laughs> I see somebody's asking about orthotics. She yep, said she spent a road. fortune on them only to find it she was better off without. Yeah, it... It, it, orthotics can be brilliant if they're prescribed correctly. Um, it depends what's wrong with you and, and um, everybody is different. So there's no one size fits all orthotic. You have to be measured and have to see what it is we're correcting. You know, what is actually the problem that you need an orthotic? I use orthotics um, probably every day for different clients, but you, I don't think you can just get them off the internet and pop them in. You need to be diagnosed probably what, assessed what, diagnosed. Yeah, yeah okay okay we have come to the top of the hour there and um you can always get in touch with nina she you run your clinic from uh, in suffolk yep. um what's the name of the town i've forgotten the name of the town. <laughs> it's i spelt like like an eyeball e-y-e -E. <laughs> i'll forget that then i in suffolk and i will be um when i give out this i uh, put the um recording out i i'm going to be putting how to get in contact with nina to have a, a more in a private chat and more in-depth uh, consultation or go and see her in suffolk and um what if people live miles away and they can't get to you nina what what's what do people look out well, for for a good podiatrist if you look for somebody who's um a member of the um, HCPC, which is Healthcare Professions Council. I've got a certificate somewhere here which says that. Oh, there it is. Yes, yeah, so that's the HCPC. Um, they don't give us certificates anymore. They just, it's all digital now, but this was my last one I received. And, but it's, um, they, if you're a member of that, then you'll be properly insured. And if you're, if you've done a three year training course, at a university and you're a podiatrist, um, then you're sort of fully trained foot doctor, really. There are, other, there are lots of other people who are very good. They're called um, foot health professionals and they um, are fabulous in the community for help, help with nail care and um, corns and callus and things, but they, they may not necessarily be um, trained to do some of the other things like nail surgery and um, biomechanics because there's they, they don't do the same training at all but they, they their role to assist podiatrists is great so my daughter is a foot health professional and she's my right hand woman <laughs> amazing amazing all in the family it's wonderful and uh, Marianne has asked an interesting question I think and I would like to know this too and what, what do you think about the Vivo barefoot shoes ah well they are interesting they don't suit everybody <laughs> They don't see everybody that like like sketches who make huge claims about being fabulous. Um, they're no better than lots of other shoes. They suit some people, and I know Barbara O'Neill is a huge fan of barefoot Vivo shoes. But if you've got a very flexible foot and you've got a lot of foot pain, 
they might not suit you because you need might need support. Um, if you've got lots of foot lesions, then there's not enough padding in them. But if you've got a young foot and you're energetic and your muscle tone is good, then they'd be good probably to wear for some of the time. That's great. Thank you, Nina. And you can't um, really so generalize about these things. We're all unique, aren't we? We're every one of us, we're all different. So if you want to get in contact with um, Nina, I'm going to be giving you, sending you the, the how to con get in contact with her. Or um, what's the name of your clinic? So people can just go oh, ahead straight away. It's, it's called Life and Soul. So Life and S-O-L-E, Soul. Um, so in I in Suffolk in England and um, uh, if you can't get in, I, I'll be sending this with to, to you but uh, if you can't get hold if you can't come and see Nina then um, who I thoroughly recommend <laughs> but if you, if you can't get there I mean I, I how many hours I was like five and a half hours God bless <laughs> you you drove all the way from London to, to was, Suffolk on a Friday I know it was <laughs> Oh no, it was a bit of a story and two Plus. two tires blew out in the meal. It was like worth it though. Thank God I think I was afraid afraid of getting my toes done. <laughs> Sabotage going on in there or something. I don't know what. But you were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And and I'm pain free now and I'm so grateful. So I'll, I'll bring the call to a close. If you just joined us, don't worry, you've got the recording coming to you and the contact, how to get in contact with Nina. So um, I just want to say thank you so much, Nina, for teaching us and, and educating us and talking to us about common foot problems that many of us come across. And um, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody here has, does has too. And thank you so much, everybody, for joining us on the Positive Future podcast. Um, we have one most weeks. So do have a look at the website to go and see which other one you'd like to go and come on to next or look at all the replays all the replays are there too and i'm sure you're going to find something very interesting we've got the herbalist lady nina mentioned and also a lady on homeopathy too and lots more but uh, nina can i give you the last word please if you wanted to say um uh, something that would be a good sort of parting something to uh, people about their foot care and what would be um um uh, uh, something you'd like would you like to say the last word to everybody Oh, well, I think um, read Barbara O'Neill's book. If you haven't read her book, Sustain Me, all those principles are for the whole body, including feet. Um, drink enough water. Most arthritis is caused by lack of caused by dehydration. So I always tell, ask my patients, drink, you know, drink water. How much do you drink? Um, and have a little bit of. Celtic sea salt inside so the water stays in your body instead of goes out straight away um check your footwear shoes are so important and just keep moving and and also try to go barefoot every day on the grass and don't forget to do your grounding and releasing all those positive ions and um yeah connect with the earth because what is fabulous That's amazing Nina <laughs> Amazing, Nina. That's absolutely wonderful advice. And thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And thank you so much, Nina, for giving us an amazing talk. Thank you. See you later. Later. <laughs> Bye. Bye.